everyone, and welcome back to Fantasy Friday. So, last time we were here, we read chapter number 15 of The Picture of Dorian Gray. And in that chapter, Dorian attended a bit of a gathering at Lady Narborough's place. And we found that he was feeling quite guilty about what he had done uh, to Basil. And it started to manifest in his mannerisms. He was feeling a little bit off, and certainly Lord Henry took note of that and briefly mentioned it to him. And then Dorian kind of shook him off and just said, well, no, I just need to go home and that'll be fine. <clears throat> and then at the very end of the chapter, we saw that he was taking off into the night wearing common clothes. So <clears throat> we're thinking, well, he probably doesn't want to be noticed by anybody who knows him. So... Let's find out what happens uh, to him now as we embark on chapter number 16. All right, chapter number 16. Cold rain began to fall, and the blurred street lamps looked ghastly in the dripping mist. The public houses were just closing, and dim men and women were clustering in broken groups round their doors. From some of the bars came the sound of horrible laughter. In others, drunkards brawled and screamed. Lying back in the hansom, with his hat pulled over his forehead, Dorian Gray watched with listless eyes the sordid shame of the great city, and now and then he repeated to himself the words that Lord Henry had said to him on the first day they had met. To cure the soul by means of the senses, and the senses by means of the soul. Yes, that was the secret. He had often tried it, and would try it again now. There were opium dens where one could buy oblivion, dens of horror where the memory of old sins could be destroyed by the madness of sins that were new. The moon hung low in the sky like a yellow skull. From time to time, a huge misshapen cloud stretched a long arm across it and hid it. The gas lamps grew fewer, and the streets more narrow and gloomy. Once the man lost his way and had to drive back half a mile. A steam rose from the horse as it splashed up with the puddles. The side windows of the hansom were clogged with a grey flannel mist. To cure the soul by means of the senses, and the senses by means of the soul. How the words rang in his ears! His soul, certainly was sick to death. Was it true that the senses could cure it? Innocent blood had been spilled. What could atone for that? Ah, for that there was no atonement. But, though forgiveness was impossible, forgetfulness was possible still. And he was determined to forget, to stamp the thing out, to crush it as one would crush the adder that had stung one. Indeed, what right had Basil to have spoken to him as he had done? Who had made him a judge over others? He had said things that were dreadful, horrible, not to be endured. On and on plodded the handsome, going slower, it seemed to him, at each step. He thrust up the trap and called to the man to drive faster. The hideous hunger for opium began to gnaw at him. His throat burned and his delicate hands twitched nervously together. He struck at the horse madly with his stick. The driver laughed and whipped up. He laughed in answer, and the man was silent. The way seemed interminable, and the streets like the black web of some sprawling spider. The monotony became unbearable, and, as the mist thickened, he felt afraid. Then they passed by lonely brick fields. The fog was lighter here, and he could see the strange, bottle-shaped kilns with their orange, fan-like tongues of fire. A dog barked as they went by, and far away, in the darkness, some wandering seagull screamed. The horse stumbled in a rut, then swerved aside and broke into a gallop. After some time, they left the clay road and rattled again over rough paven streets. Most of the windows were dark, but now and then fantastic shadows were silhouetted against some lamplit blind. He watched them curiously. 
They moved like monstrous marionettes and made gestures like live things. He hated them. A dull rage was in his heart. As they turned a corner, a woman yelled something at them from an open door, and two men ran after the hansom for about a hundred yards. The driver beat at them with his whip. It is said that passion makes one think in a circle. Certainly, with hideous iteration, the bitten lips of Dorian Gray shaped and reshaped those subtle words that dealt with soul and sense, till he had found in them the full expression, as it were, of his mood, and justified, by intellectual approval, passions that without such justification would still have dominated his temper. From cell to cell of his brain crept the one thought, and the wild desire to live, most terrible of all man's appetites, quickened into force, each trembling nerve and fiber. Ugliness that had once been hateful to him, because it made things real, became dear to him now for that very reason. Ugliness was the one reality. The coarse brawl, the loathsome den, the crude violence of disordered life, the very vileness of thief and outcast, were more vivid in their intense actuality of impression than all the gracious shapes of art, the dreamy shadows of song. They were what he needed for forgetfulness. In three days he would be free. Suddenly the man drew up with a jerk at the top of a dark lane. Over the low roofs and jagged chimney stacks of the houses rose the black masts of ships. Wreaths of white mist clung like ghostly sails to the yards. Somewhere about here, sir, ain't it? He asked huskily through the trap. Dorian started and peered round. This will do, he answered, and having got out hastily and given the driver the extra fare he had promised him, he walked quickly in the direction of the quay. Here and there a lantern gleamed at the stern of some huge merchantman. The light shook and splintered in the puddles. A red glare came from an outward-bound steamer that was coaling. The slimy pavement looked like a wet mackintosh. He hurried on towards the left, glancing back now and then to see if he was being followed. In about seven or eight minutes he reached a small, shabby house that was wedged in between two gaunt factories. In one of the top windows stood a lamp. He stopped and gave a peculiar knock. After a little time, he heard steps in the passage and the chain being unhooked. The door opened quietly, and he went in without saying a word to the squat, misshapen figure that flattened itself into the shadow as he passed. At the end of the hall hung a tattered green curtain that swayed and shook in the gusty wind which had followed him in from the street. He dragged it aside and entered a long, low room, which looked as if it had been once a third-rate dancing saloon. Shrill, flaring gas jets, dulled and distorted in the fly-blown mirrors that faced them, were ranged round the walls. Greasy reflectors of ribbed tin backed them, masking quivering disks of light. The floor was covered with ochre-colored sawdust, trampled here and there into mud, and stained with dark rings of spilled liquor. Some malays were crouching by a little charcoal stove, playing with bone counters and showing their white teeth as they chattered. In one corner, with his head buried in his arms, a sailor sprawled over a table, and by the tawdrily painted bar that ran across one complete side stood two haggard women, mocking an old man who was brushing the sleeves of his coat with an expression of disgust. "'He thinks he's got red ants on him!' laughed one of them as Dorian passed by. The man looked at her in terror and began to whimper. At the end of the room, there was a little staircase, leading to a darkened chamber. As Dorian hurried up its three rickety steps, the heavy odor of opium met him. He heaved a deep breath, and his nostrils quivered with pleasure. When he entered, a young man with smooth yellow hair, who was bending over a lamp lighting a long, thin pipe, looked up at him and nodded in a hesitating manner. "'You here, Adrian?' muttered Dorian. "'Where else should I be?' he answered listlessly. "'None of the chaps will speak to me now.' "'I thought you had left England.' "'Darlington is not going to do anything. "'My brother paid the bill at last. "'George doesn't speak to me either. 
<sighs> I don't care, he added with a sigh. As long as one has this stuff, one doesn't want friends. I think I have had too many friends. Dorian winced and looked round at the grotesque things that lay in such fantastic postures on the ragged mattresses. The twisted limbs, the gaping mouths, the staring lusterless eyes fascinated him. He knew in what strange heavens they were suffering, and what dull hells were teaching them the secret of some new joy. They were better off than he was. He was prisoned in thought. Memory, like a horrible malady, was eating his soul away. From time to time, he seemed to see the eyes of Basil Hallward looking at him. Yet he felt he could not stay. The presence of Adrian Singleton troubled him. He wanted to be where no one would know who he was. He wanted to escape from himself. I am going on to the other place, he said after a pause. On the wharf? Yes. The mad cat is sure to be there. They won't have her in this place now. Dorian shrugged his shoulders. I am sick of women who love one. Women who hate one are much more interesting. Besides, the stuff is better. Much the same. I like it better. Come and have something to drink. I must have something. I don't want anything, murmured the young man. Never mind. Adrian Singleton rose up wearily and followed Dorian to the bar. A half-caste, in a ragged turban and a shabby ulster, grinned a hideous greeting as he thrust a bottle of brandy and two tumblers in front of them. The women sidled up and began to chatter. Dorian turned his back on them and said something in a low voice to Adrian Singleton. A crooked smile, like a Malay crease, writhed across the face of one of the women. We are very proud tonight, she sneered. For God's sake, don't talk to me, cried Dorian, stamping his foot on the ground. What do you want? Money? Here it is. Don't ever talk to me again. Two red sparks flashed for a moment in the woman's sodden eyes, then flickered out and left them dull and glazed. She tossed her head and raked the coins off the counter with greedy fingers. Her companion watched her enviously. It's no use, sighed Adrian Singleton. I don't care to go back. What does it matter? I am quite happy here. You will write to me if you want anything, won't you? said Dorian, after a pause. Perhaps. Good night, then. Good night, answered the young man, passing up the steps and wiping his parched mouth with a handkerchief. Dorian walked to the door with a look of pain in his face. As he drew the curtain aside, a hideous laugh broke from the painted lips of the woman who had taken his money. There goes the devil's bargain, she hiccuped in a coarse voice. Curse you, he answered. Don't call me that. She snapped her fingers. Prince Charming is what you like to be called, ain't it? She yelled after him. The drowsy sailor leaped to his feet as she spoke, and looked wildly round. The sound of the shutting of the hall door fell on his ear. He rushed out, as if in pursuit. Dorian Gray hurried along the quay through the drizzling rain. His meeting with Adrian Singleton had strangely moved him, and he wondered if the ruin of that young life was really to be laid at his door, as Basil Hallward had said to him with such infamy of insult. He bit his lip, and for a few seconds his eyes grew sad. Yet, after all, what did it matter to him? One's days were too brief to take the burden of another's errors on one's shoulders. Each man lived his own life and paid his own price for living it. The only pity was one had to pay so often for a single fault. One had to pay over and over again indeed. In her dealings with man, destiny never closed her accounts. There are moments, psychologists tell us, when the passion for sin, or for, for what the world calls sin, so dominates a nature that every fiber of the body, 
as every cell of the brain, seems to be instinct with fearful impulses. Men and women at such moments lose the freedom of their will. They move to their terrible end as automatons move. Choice is taken from them, and conscience is either killed or, if it lives at all, lives but to give rebellion its fascination and disobedience its charm. For all sins, as theologians weary not of reminding us, are sins of disobedience. When that high spirit, that morning star of evil, fell from heaven, it was as a rebel that he fell. Callous, concentrated on evil, with stained mind, and soul hungry for rebellion, Dorian Gray hastened on, quickened his step as he went, but as he darted aside into a dim archway that had served him often as a shortcut to the ill-famed place where he was going, he felt himself suddenly seized from behind, and before he had time to defend himself, he was thrust back against the wall with a brutal hand round his throat. He struggled madly for life, and by a terrible effort wrenched the tightening fingers away. In a second he heard the click of a revolver, and saw the gleam of a polished barrel pointing straight at his head, and the dusky form of a short, thick-set man facing him. "'What do you want?' he gasped. "'Keep quiet,' said the man. "'If you stir, I shoot you.' "'You are mad. What have I done to you?' "'You wrecked the life of Sybil Vane.' was the answer, and Sybil Vane was my sister. She killed herself. I know it. Her death is at your door. I swore I would kill you in return. For years I have sought you. I had no clue, no trace. The two people who could have described you were dead. I knew nothing of you but the pet name she used to call you. I heard it tonight by chance. Make your peace with God, for tonight you're going to die. Dorian Gray grew sick with fear. "'I never knew her,' he stammered. I, "'I never heard of her. You are mad!' "'You had better confess your sin, for as sure as I am James Vane, you are going to die!' There was a horrible moment. Dorian did not know what to say or do. "'Down on your knees!' growled the man. "'I give you one minute to make your peace. No more. I go on board tonight for India, and I must do my job.' First, one minute, that's all. Dorian's arms fell to his side. Paralyzed with terror, he did not know what to do. Suddenly, a wild hope flashed across his brain. Stop, he cried. How long ago is it since your sister died? Quick, tell me. Eighteen years, said the man. Why do you ask me? What do years matter? Eighteen years? laughed Dorian Gray, with a touch of triumph in his voice. Eighteen years! Set me under the lamp, and look at my face! James Vane hesitated for a moment, not understanding what was meant. Then he seized Dorian Gray and dragged him from the archway. Dim and wavering as was the wind-blown light, yet it served to show him the hideous error as it seemed, into which he had fallen, for the face of the man he had sought to kill had all the bloom of boyhood, all the unstained purity of youth. He seemed little more than a lad of twenty summers, hardly older, if older indeed at all, than his sister had been when they had parted so many years ago. It was obvious that this was not the man who had destroyed her life. He loosened his hold and reeled back. "'My God! My God!' he cried, and I would have murdered you. Dorian Gray drew a long breath. You have been on the brink of committing a terrible crime, my man, he said, looking at him sternly. Let this be a warning to you not to take vengeance into your own hands. Forgive me, sir, muttered James Vane. I was deceived. A chance word I heard in that damned den set me on the wrong track. "'You had better go home and put that pistol away, or you may get into trouble,' said Dorian, turning on his heel and going slowly down the street. James Vane stood on the pavement in horror. He was trembling from head to foot. After a little while, a black shadow that had been creeping along the dripping wall moved out into the light and came close to him with stealthy footsteps. He felt a hand laid on his arm and looked round with a start. It was one of the women who had been drinking at the bar. "'Why didn't you kill him?' 
she hissed out, putting her haggard face quite close to his. I knew you were following him when you rushed out from Daly's. You fool! You should have killed him! He has lots of money, and he's as bad as bad! He's not the man I'm looking for, he answered, and I want no man's money. I want a man's life. The man whose life I want must be nearly forty now. This one is a little more than a boy. Thank God I have not got his blood upon my hands. The woman gave a bitter laugh. Little more than a boy, she sneered. Why, man, it's nigh on eighteen years since Prince Charming made me what I am. You lie, cried James Vane. She raised her hand up to heaven. Before God, I am telling the truth, she cried. Before God? Strike me dumb if it ain't so. He is the worst one that comes here. They say he has sold himself to the devil for a pretty face. It's nigh on eighteen years since I met him. He hasn't changed much since then. I have, though, she added with a sickly leer. You swear this? I swear it, came in hoarse echo from her flat mouth. But don't give me away to him, she whined. I am afraid of him. Let me have some money for my night's lodging. He broke from her with an oath and rushed to the corner of the street, but Dorian Gray had disappeared. When he looked back, the woman had vanished also. And so concludes chapter 16 of the picture of Dorian Gray. Awful, awful events. Dorian decides to take a cab across town, way across town, to go to an opium den. So he intends to go, well, forget. That was his goal. He, he did mention that. All of the sorrows of the world, well, could be forgotten. That was still one fate available to him. And he thought, well, if he filled himself with drugs, he would be able to forget all of the horrors he had committed throughout his life. Well, upon entering the opium den, he met with his former friend, Adrian Singleton. Now, we don't know Adrian Singleton, but we have been introduced to him before. Basil Hallward happened to mention during his, just before he died, uh, that Dorian had ruined Adrian's life. Now, we don't know how, or if that's even possible, but we see the wreckage wrought by Dorian's, you know, sin. Uh, we see Adrian Singleton reduced to little more than an opium smoker. He was just in the den, just listless and languorous and without any sort of vitality at all whatsoever. His life had been taken from him. And Dorian is repulsed by this, so he doesn't want to occupy the same den as Adrian, so he decides to leave. Upon leaving, however, he is met by James Vane, Sybil Vane's brother, whom we met a while ago in the story, towards the beginning, actually, I believe it was chapter five. And he remembers, he, for the entire 18 years, he had held this grudge against Dorian because he knew that his sister killed herself and he strongly suspected that Dorian had something to do with it. And he would be correct in assuming so. So he finds Dorian and he pins him up against the wall and he threatens to shoot him. He gives him one minute to confess, to, you know, before God, confess his sins and be acquitted, maybe, of them uh, before James is going to kill him. But Dorian, in his manipulative way, tells James to bring him into the light. And he reveals that he is falsely accusing Dorian. Because, well, Dorian looks like, a you know, an 18-year-old man. <laughs> He's just, uh, he looks like a teenager, right? He looks like a boy. Uh, and he know, and James Vane knows well, you know, 18 years ago, you would have just been born. There's no way that uh, you were the one who were involved with my sister. So he lets him go because Dorian has this never ending youth, right? He can use that to his advantage. And in this case, he certainly does. And then James Vane is horror struck. He, he doesn't know what to do. He's shaking and he, he understands, wow, I almost ended a man's life and it was not the right man. But then a woman comes out of the bar and tells him that, no, that is Dorian Gray. That is Prince Charming. And he is the man that you were looking for. Uh, he sold his soul to the devil for eternal youth. Now, 
that might just be a bit of a rumor, but it turns out that's actually the truth, right? He he has the picture at home, which is absorbing all the guilt of his conscience. And he gets to roam free, looking like a boy of 18. So, obviously James is very upset about this, and he wants to find Dorian. So we have to bear that in mind as we move on towards the end of the story. But yes, very, very interesting chapter. We see that Dorian finally had the opportunity to, well, if he can't forget all of his sins, he could just, well, end them. It's kind of morbid to think about, you know, one does not wish death upon anyone, but uh, we think in his situation, if he's struggling like that, well, here is his, you know, one of the more noble ways to die, you know, maybe not so noble, but, uh, you know, a little more, you know, justifiable. We have uh, Sybil's brother wanting to take his life, which is a crime in itself, and of course not something to admire. But um, it is curious the way Doreen's decision-making works. So let's think on that for a little bit. Lots of different avenues we could take uh, in terms of thoughts. But uh, yeah, think about that. And then next week, we will continue on with the next chapter of The Picture of Dorian Gray. So I look forward to see you and seeing you all then. But until then, enjoy your weekend. Bye now.